Hallo Rupert. Hi. Hi. I say I feel a little bit nervous about it. Tell us your name. It's a Craig. Craig. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Craig. Yeah. Um, my question is um, <clears throat> about about when I was younger. I had a. Um, I used to have this sensation where, when I was kind of, when I was relaxed, I would I would um, suddenly feel like um, I'm going through a vacuum, through like a. Not um, like a tunnel, and it'd be, be be very quick, and then I would kind of come back to my to myself, and I would um, it, it it'd be like this this, this kind of um, how can I explain? It was like a, a, a an amazing thing, like a wow. I describe it as like a wow. It was like you know, and I would kind of touch myself and think. Gosh, I'm I'm a, I'm real. I'm a real person. I'm you know physical, and and I would think about my parents, and and, and it was just like it, it's as if I just kind of like I said, just went for a kind of this, this kind of vacuum, as if I was pulled, and then straight back into my kind of self, my body. I, I guess I could explain it, and it's not something I've really thought about for a long time. Um, and it wasn't scary, but it was it was a little strange, and it's hard to kind of remember how often it happened when I was, you know, when it did. Um, but the reason I brought it up is because I've got a 13-year-old daughter, and I was talking to her um, a couple of weeks ago um, about loss of a dog, and we, you know, we were talking about different issues, and she she explained this she explained to me that she's had she's been having the same sensation, and she's she's not. It's not something that she's afraid of, um, but she's not mentioned mentioned it to us, you know, previously, and it, it just made me remember the same experience that I had. Um, and I, I guess my question is, I just wonder if you could shine some light on, so I could then, you know, go back to my daughter and maybe help her understand what it is. Yes, you you, you briefly stepped out of time and visited eternity and then you came back into time. Perhaps don't describe it to your daughter in, that, in those terms, but, but um, you might need to un unpack that a bit for her. So to, to use Mary and Jane as an analogy, Mary falls asleep in Froyle, she dreams she's Jane on the streets of Paris. The, the time and space that seem to be real from Jane's point of view, don't exist in Mary's mind. The, the, J Jane can spend a whole day on the streets of Paris, shopping, meeting lunch for a friend, uh, more shopping, going out for dinner, going to a movie in the evening, and then Mary wakes up. How much time did what was 12 hours for Jane, how much time did it take up in Mary's mind? The dream happens like that. So, and, and likewise, the space. J Jane spent the day, she walked four miles in Paris that day. How much space in Mary's mind did the dream take up? It didn't take up any space in Mary's mind. The time and space that seemed to be real from Jane's point of view in the dream don't take up any time and space in Mary's mind, which is the reality of the dreamed world. So what happened to translate what you and your daughter experienced into this analogy? Jane was walking along the streets of uh, Paris. In the case of your daughter, you said that it coincided with the death of your dog. Is that right? That's, that's when she first... That's when he first mentioned happened. it, but she said it's well, happened to her. Okay, but it's, it's, it's not insignificant that it happened at, at least once with the death of your dog. Why? Because up until the death of your dog, your daughter's life is just going along fine. And then something brings her to a halt. This dog that she presumably loved very much dies. So at that moment, her world freezes. It's that the flow of her life is halted. Her mind comes to an end. Great sorrow, great grief is one of the ways the mind is brought to an end. And when the mind is brought to an end, time, which in reality only exists in the, in the mind, also comes to an end. So that is why 
sometimes very profound experiences are precipitated by very intense emotion of, of grief, amazement, fear, shock. So in her case, she gets this shock. It brings her mind briefly to an end. When the mind ends, the experience of time ends, and she visits eternity, which means, in our analogy, that at that moment she ceases to feel, I am Jane. And there is this recognition, I am Mary. And Mary's mind is nowhere in her world. That's why you said, when you described it, you said, I was sucked, you described it beautifully, you said, I was sucked out. But you didn't tell us where you went. You can't describe where you went, because where you went is not known by your finite mind. Jane doesn't know where Mary's mind is, because Mary's mind is not in Jane's world. So when Jane feels, I'm, I'm sucked out of my mind, like, like you, she knows that something happened. Her world came to an end. She went somewhere else, but she doesn't know where that somewhere else is. It's Mary's mind asleep in fro. She doesn't know where it is, because she can't find it in her world. All she can say was, in a rather inarticulate, and I don't mean that pejoratively, the kind of inarticulate way you say, you said, I was sucked out of my experience. Well, you can't say more than that because your finite mind has no knowledge of where you went. Jane has no knowledge of Mary's mind asleep in Froyo because Jane's world exists on the streets of Paris. But that's what's happening. You're, 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 you're literally... Uh, Visiting eternity, you're, you're ceasing, the flow of time is coming to an end, and at that moment you plunge into eternity. You cease being a temporary finite self, and you, you, you experience yourself as unlimited being, which is not in time or space. Time and space are in being. Jane's mind does not exist in, sorry, Mary's mind does not exist in Jane's world. Jane's world exists in Mary's mind. This world does not, consciousness does not exist in this world. This world exists in consciousness. I guess, I guess the, the, the other example I've had as an adult is, um, it's not the same, but if I've been walking in the forest, um, sometimes I'll, not very often at all, but I've had it where, you know, I'm just walking along, I'm not really thinking, and all of, all of a sudden I'll have like a, a real sense of joy and just want to start laughing. But but when I then think about why I've done it, it that it, it, it goes, you know, that kind of... Yes, because your something? rational mind tries to bring the experience into its own world. The experience of, of joy, you're, you're walking along, you're not thinking of anything particular, and there is this feeling of causeless joy. Causeless joy means joy that, that doesn't come from any known direction. It doesn't become because of what you're seeing, what you're listening to on your, on your, on your phone, what you're thinking about. It's suddenly this, this joy comes from an unknown direction. That is Mary's mind impinging on Jane's experience. Suddenly Jane's walking along the streets of Paris, and, and, and there's this feeling of causeless joy. What is that? That is Mary's mind shining in Jane's experience. But Mary's mind is not on the streets of Paris. So Jane looks around and, and thinks, what is it that accounts for this joy? It's nothing that's happening on the streets of Paris. It's not my meal. It's not my friend. It's not the movie. And yet I feel this joy. Where's it coming from? I can't find its source in my world. She's right. The source of it is not in her world or in her mind, it's, it, it, it's, it comes from Mary's mind, which is outside anything that her finite mind knows. So when you're walking in the forest, there's something about the activity of walking in the forest. Your, your body is, 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 is engaged in this rhythmical movement. Your mind is relaxed and open. Something about your circumstances, you didn't need your dog to die. It was another circumstance, just your mind was open and relaxed, that enabled you to intuit the, the, the essence of your own mind, the essence of your own mind um, interrupted your thought process. And in that moment, it, it flooded your mind with its, with its nature of happiness. So you feel this joy, but you know, where does that come from? It doesn't come from anything I know. It, that's causeless joy. It is the nature of being, interrupting the, the flow of your Thoughts. Thank you.
is what Wordsworth referred to when he said, that I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns and the round ocean and the living air and the blue sky and in the mind of man. A motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things, all objects of all thoughts, and rolls through all things. It, it, it's what he was referring to. And I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts. This presence that comes from somewhere. He's walking in the Lake District. And then suddenly, this presence disturbs him. It, it, it cuts across. It cuts through his line of thinking. His line of thinking takes him on a line of time. And then something disturbs him. And in that moment, he plunges into eternity. And I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thought. A sense, of a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused. He, he's trying to, in this beautiful way, give language to th this sense of being disturbed by something. The normal flow of our thoughts and actions being halted by the death of our dog or the beauty of the landscape or a feeling of sorrow or whatever it is, uh, an experience that cuts through the, the, the horizontal dimension of time on which we live our lives and plunges us momentarily, and not momentarily, it's timelessly, into, into eternity, which means into our being. And, then, and its nature, with them, which is peace and joy, then floods the mind and you feel this great joy or this great peace. That's why sometimes people who um, experience great grief, and it's a, it's a strange conjunction of feelings, you can experience great grief, the, the, the loss of a loved one, for instance. And the loss of a, of a loved one brings your, brings your normal activities of thinking and feeling to an end. And in that ending, you can feel an immense wave of peace or love. So that's why joy, uh, grief and joy are sometimes very closely associated. I remember I felt, felt it very, very powerfully once. I felt it many times less powerfully, but one of the times I was more aware of this than any other time was when I lived in uh, Shropshire. And I had my uh, studio and, and workshop there, and I had spent uh, um, 10 years renovating these beautiful old barns, and, and they all burned down one night. The rafters above my kiln caught fire, and the whole place burned down. And I was, um, I was sitting, there was a the house, and the, it was a traditional old farm, and there was a house and a courtyard, and then the farm buildings, which I had converted into my studio. And I was sitting on the, on the wall outside the house, watching, it was a scene of utter devastation, watching these magnificent, 17th century barns ju just blazing to the ground, fire engines there trying to put them out to, to, to no avail. And I felt in, in the background this wave of this ocean of peace behind me, supporting me. Because the, the, the experience was so intense. It was so devastating. It was like 10 years of work being burnt to the ground in, in, in two hours. But so it, it completely brought my, my future to, to an end. I mean, not, not literally, but, but what I had projected into the future. It brought it to an end. There was, I, it, it stopped my thinking what I was going to do tomorrow and next week, and, and etc. It brought it to an end. And this, this was this interruption, this presence that disturbed me. And, and I felt it physically, because it was a very intense situation. I felt it physically. It was like feeling that I was leaning against an, like an ocean of peace. It was, I felt so peaceful. And then people, all the people from the village were coming and, and helping and everything like that. And I felt, and people were asking me how I was. And I remember feeling guilty that I felt so peaceful. I remember feeling that in order to satisfy their projection onto me, I had to act upset and distressed because I didn't think they'd believe me. But I felt, and it was not because of anything I did, it wasn't, uh, it was just, it, it happened in spite of myself, not because of myself. Now, that was a very extreme version. It happens in much, much quieter ways as, as well. So you'll have to try and find a way of uh, translating that into, for your daughter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, what, to be honest, she's actually got a, a very, 
we lost another dog about two years ago. And we were walking in the, in, in the forest again um, a week later, and we actually saw the dogs. It sounds very unrealistic, but I've got photos and video. Uh, but we actually saw the dog's head in the, in the, in the clouds. Uh, incredibly, you know, the fact that there was two independent people, we, we just saw it, it, it emerged, and then it was gone. No. So she's, she's yeah. I don't know what I'm trying to say here, but... Yeah, no, just... th that's very beautiful. That's what Jung would call a, a synchronicity. And under the materialist paradigm, things like that are, should be impossible. And we have to explain them away by saying that both you and your daughter were just fabricating it. And the fact that you both agreed, well, it was because you both discussed it afterwards and you, you, you retrospectively altered your story in order to confirm that that's the way a, the conventional materialistic paradigm would interpret experiences like this. But these kind of synchronistic experiences happen so often. Is there anyone here who has not had some kind of synchronistic um, experience like that? I, I've asked this question to many people. I, I've never had anybody. I've asked probably this question to thousands of people. I've never had anyone say that they haven't had some synchronistic experience. They, um, they thought of a friend they hadn't seen for 10 years. They wake up the next morning and there's an email from her in, in their inbox the next morning. This kind of thing. Now, these kind of experiences are, should not be, uh, cannot be accounted for under the prevailing materialist paradigm. They need to be dismissed as fabrications or... Or, or um, coincidences, but under the th this uh, paradigm that we speak of here, the, the, the non-dual understanding or the perennial philosophy, what we essentially are the the, uh, the the essence of our own mind and the reality of the world are, are the same. It's not that. Internally, we are made of mind, and externally, the world is made of matter. The world made of matter is just how the activity of consciousness appears from our localized point of view. But consciousness is the reality in this approach. Consciousness is the reality of both our own individual minds and of the outside world. So there is a very, very close conjunction between what takes place on the inside and what takes place on the outside, and under this, uh, in this paradigm, synchronicities like this are to be expected. They're just confirmations that there is a deep connection between our, the, the, the essence of our mind and the reality of the world. Thank you.